Hello and welcome to the Attunement Emissary Legacy Series. My name is Gary Goodhue and I will be your host. I'm really excited about this episode. This is talk number five in Approach to Christmas by Martin Cecil. And this talk was given on Christmas Eve. And really, it's kind of a sum up of the four previous talks and the main points he's been going in, as well as wrapping it all together for a beautiful big picture. So without further ado, Martin Cecil, Approach to Christmas. Christmas is a time when there are particular family gatherings throughout the length and breadth of what is called Christendom. And there is a good feeling of drawing close together in family patterns as human beings know such things. But it would seem that there should be a deeper and more widespread realization of that larger family, which includes all human beings everywhere. This is, or should be, the divine family under the parenthood of God. Just as we find in so many patterns in the world, conflict, misunderstandings, so do we find it in the family of human beings the world around. There is no basis for harmony, no basis for true understanding, except as there is a recognition of and an acknowledgement of the parenthood of God. We remember the words which our master spoke when he was on earth, indicating that while he may have had relatives in the human sense, his brother and his sister were actually those who did the will of God on earth. It is only in the doing of the will of God that the correct relationship between human beings can appear. And God's will cannot be done on earth except as human beings are willing to let God do it. Again, we are reminded that only God can do God's will. Human beings can exercise their human wills in various ways, some presumed to be good, others to be bad. But only God can do God's will, and God's will is neither good nor bad. It is simply perfect. As we move towards Christmas Day, remembering that which is celebrated on that day, we need to recognize clearly the significance of those events. In our recent services, we've been sharing meditation upon these things, seeking to let our hearts be purified, for only the pure in heart can see God. Only the pure in heart, therefore, can see the true significance of Christmas. There is a stirring in the hearts of multitudes of human beings at Christmas time. New and different feelings are experienced by many. There is a greater spirit of what might be called good fellowship. Sometimes it goes to some peculiar extremes, and there is a sharing in a more meaningful spirit of givingness. But it has always seemed a strange thing to me that in celebrating the birthday of our Lord and King, so much consideration should be given to the giving of gifts by one human being to another. From the human standpoint, when somebody has a birthday, the usual attitude is that the one whose birthday it is receives the gift. Of course, we might say that our master is not here on earth. How shall we give him any gifts? And yet human beings have gifts which they should give him. Perhaps if they were not so concerned merely about pleasing each other, they might be more concerned about pleasing God 
about giving a true gift to our Lord and King. What would that gift be if not the human being himself? It is evident from the most causal considerations in relationship to the state of the world that human beings have not yet given that gift to the Lord in any adequate sense. Perhaps there are those who have been stirred in their hearts and desire to do so. We have considerable activity in many places of an evangelistic nature. Usually in such meetings there is a call to those who feel the urge to come up and give themselves to Christ, as it is put. Depending on the emotional currents that have been stirred, there are usually a fairly large number of human beings who present themselves. At that moment, there is a desire to give to God. But how to do it so that it has meaning? Considering the vast numbers, relatively speaking, of earnest and sincere human beings who over the last several years have presented themselves under such circumstances, surely we would anticipate seeing more remarkable results in the world than have yet appeared. Looking back to the experience of the disciples shortly after our Master's ascension, as I recall it, there were a hundred and twenty individuals gathered with one accord in one place in Jerusalem. There was something experienced which we recognize as providing the starting point for greater experiences if there had been a willingness to let it work out in God's way. But even with that initial experience, even with the pattern of impatience which developed, there was a manifestation of considerable power and an impact upon those who were in the vicinity. Surely if the thousands who have been supposedly giving themselves to the Lord were really doing so, then the power of God would be working with greater effectiveness in the world than we see it. We would not detract in any way from the earnestness and sincerity of human beings who seek to give themselves to the Lord. The point is that it is evident that they do not know how to do it. Human beings have some ideas, some concepts, some beliefs with respect to the process. But on the basis of that, the world has come to its present pass. Because there have certainly been earnest and sincere people seeking to give themselves to the Lord for a long time, generation upon generation, for ages past. We have recognized that human beings can only see God actually come to know the truth when they are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It does not say, Blessed are the earnest and sincere, for they shall see God. Blessed are the good people, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We have been considering what it means to be pure in heart, clearing out some of the nonsense which human beings have assumed to indicate purity. We took note of our Master's commandment, Let not your heart be troubled, and we recognized that disturbed emotions, which cause the heart to be in a turmoil, keep the individual from perceiving spiritual things. There are many human beings who consider themselves to be practical and sensible, who poo-poo the idea that there can be any spiritual levels of being, simply because they insist that they must see and contact anything if they are to believe in it, 
if they are to acknowledge that it is a fact. Those who are pure in heart have the facilities within themselves for contacting the things of the Spirit of God. Those who take the attitude that they are not going to believe anything that they cannot see or touch place themselves in rather a contradictory position. I wonder if they imagine that they never feel anything, anger or resentment or jealousy or some other thing. There is only one way by which human beings can make contact with the things of God, and that is through the heart, through the feeling realm, through the emotions. If the emotions are in a state of turmoil, the heart is not pure. If the heart is filled with evil spirits, ill reactions, then the heart is not pure. We saw that purity of heart has very little to do with human concepts about sex. The heart is pure when the individual is open to the Spirit of God and is unmoved, uncontrolled, uninfluenced, undisturbed by the impacts of those things which come out of the world to impinge upon the feeling realm. In our examination of the Christmas story, we saw that to have meaning, it must have a direct relationship to ourselves. This being so, we recognize that the manner of our master's conception and birth was in no way different to the conception and birth of every other human being who has ever been born into the world. We are not any more looking for excuses for failing to be what God created us to be. And we saw that if our master's birth was somehow miraculous, it places him in a different category to us. And therefore we have a ready-made excuse for failure. Our master was not interested in failure. He instructed human beings to follow him. How could they follow him if he was something which they were not, or which we are not? The principles of his conception and birth were in no way different to the principles of our conception and birth. Consequently, it becomes immediately possible for human beings to follow our Lord and King without constantly excusing themselves for being less than they know in their hearts that they should be, for constantly taking the attitude, after all, we are only human. Human beings are no more and no less human than our Master was. Having recognized, then, in relationship to this story, that we cannot honestly accept any excuses for ourselves. We can give consideration to something of the symbolism of the story as it relates to ourselves. There are many aspects which we might consider, but this which worked out back there is something which, properly speaking, should work out both in the individual life and collectively speaking. There is a babe to be born. Now, we take note of the fact that a babe, when it is born, is not yet mature. That birth takes place in different ways, it is true, but it takes place in all human beings. Unfortunately, with all too many, it goes unheeded and the child dies. We took note of the fact that it was because the babe Jesus came to the point of maturity and allowed the expression of deity to be revealed on earth in the ministry of our Lord and King that that birth had meaning. If the child had died, we would not be celebrating Christmas tomorrow. It was not actually the birth of the babe in and of itself that had meaning. It was because of that which was made possible by reason of that birth. 
and there is something made possible for each and every human being by reason of a similar pattern of birth within the individual. When our Master was born in Bethlehem, there were very few who were aware of the fact. By and large, his birth went completely unheeded. Of course, from the standpoint of those who call themselves Christians, the fact of it is very much emphasized. We sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and various other songs, to indicate what a wonderful and glorious thing it was. And indeed it was, but scarcely any human beings were aware of it. We find a very similar situation with respect to that birth which takes place within the individual. It is such a little thing, and it takes place in such insignificant circumstances that usually it is simply passed by, unnoticed, and the human being goes on his way without any recognition that something precious had been offered and had been rejected. Of course, that birth may take place more than once. It is fortunate that it is so. But there is a birth within the individual by reason of something divinely conceived of a little form capable of growing out of the baby stage into that of childhood, out of childhood into youth, and out of youth into maturity. Just as you as human beings grew up to the point of physical maturity without any particular effort on your part, so also may this other cycle work out. It is not a matter of effort or trying. It is a matter of letting it take place, a matter of being willing to allow the development to occur. It is a matter of being willing to offer care and protection and the essential food and clothing that is needful for the development of that which grows under the influence of the Spirit of God. You came to physical maturity by reason of the working of the Spirit of God in you, not because you decided that you were going to do not because you figured out just how you were going to be. You did not have too much to say in the matter, did you? By foolish action, you might have interfered with the process somewhat, failed to allow the fullness of that which you should be physically to appear. But whatever measure of physical perfection has been revealed in you, it came to pass by reason of something working in you not under your direction and control. Because human beings cannot do anything else but let that work out. Apart from interfering somewhat, they are willing, apparently, to trust God. But when it comes to any other development into patterns of maturity, of mind, heart, and spirit, there is not so much trust in God and the individual thinks that he must do it himself. As we have noted so many times, that which is of God's designing grows to maturity in quietness and without any struggle, without any endeavor to force anything. It unfolds naturally and so easily. We have considered the growth of a tree, for instance, something that man cannot create. No struggle, no effort, just a natural unfolding. So should it be with human beings. But of course, we have lived in a world where there is not the attitude, where there is not the belief of human beings. Consequently, we, as the generations before us, have been subjected to a forcing process. Things have been imposed upon us, even as we may have tended to impose things upon others, and God has not had much of a chance. And we see the results all around us. 
but there is that which may be born in each one and which under the right conditions can grow and develop and become the true expression of life for that human being. Most of you imagine that you are adults. Consequently, you have established for yourselves a pattern of life expression which you accept as being what you are. And that which appears on that basis, humanly established and developed, is in fact not what you are in reality. It is a counterfeit. The only way we can be what we are is to let the babe develop and grow and come to maturity. Of course, the process should work out concurrently with the natural growth of the child. That is the way God designed it. But human beings have not been content to let it work that way. So the starting point is necessarily with respect to those who have reached physical maturity, you folks amongst others, and you must start then at the point of the birth of the child. Even as our Master said, Except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. There must be that starting point and that subsequent development and growth if the expression that should appear through that individual is to be that which would naturally establish citizenship in the kingdom. A human counterfeit is no good. Human beings cannot force their way into the kingdom by any means whatsoever. And let us remember that that kingdom is supposed to come here on earth, not that we should go someplace but it should be entered here while we live on earth. There were three wise men who brought gifts to the babe Jesus shortly after his birth, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And when the babe is born in the individual, it is a babe and it needs that which is essential for its welfare, just as the babe Jesus did. The gold was very useful in enabling the journey to be made down into Egypt, for instance. But gold is the symbol of love, God's love. And it is absolutely essential that if that babe is to develop within the human being, there should be the atmosphere of love. There were three gifts, and we can recognize their correlation with the three primary aspects of the Spirit of God, love, truth, and life. The atmosphere which enables the growth and the development of things divine within the individual must be maintained, otherwise they wither and die. And Herod, the self-active mind of man, of course, is intent upon destroying them. The babe needs that care and consideration, just as human beings give care and consideration to their children. And how does that atmosphere come to enfold the babe? This babe, you know, is what you really are, not in its final expression, but in the point of initiation. You do not know what you are. In its point of initiation, it is a little thing that must unfold and grow. And how shall that atmosphere be provided? Just in the measure of your purity of heart? I would remind you of the first great commandment, to love God with all. The second, like unto it, to let God's love extend to love your neighbor as yourself. What self? Your true self, the babe that has been born. 
The babe needs to be wrapped in swaddling clothes, as it is put, to be protected by the atmosphere of heaven. In this Christmas season, I would draw to your attention that the evidence of the fulfillment of the first great commandment, it must come first, remember, is revealed in your feeling and attitude towards others. If your heart is not right in relationship to anyone, there is evidence that your heart is not right with God. For the heart to be right in relationship to one's neighbor, one necessarily must learn to love God first. But the evidence of love for God is revealed in the feeling and the attitude towards others. I have heard individuals say on occasion, Well, as long as I am right with the Lord, that is all that matters. And that is true enough, quite true, as long as you are right with the Lord. But sometimes that is taken to excuse a wrong pattern of feeling and attitude towards someone else. And, of course, the spirit of self-righteousness enters in. The individual says, I am right with the Lord. That other person had better change his ways so as to come right with me. Well, that is possible. The other person may have to change his ways. But that is his business. Your business is to let your ways be changed. You remember that the wise men, those who were wise, went back to their own land by another way. They did not go back the same way they had come. A new way. We need to walk in a new way, regardless of what anyone else does. And in that new way, one's heart is right with others, regardless of what is happening in their hearts. If some ill attitude, ill feeling, is maintained towards another anywhere, I do not care who it is, then you may know, if that is true of you, that your heart is not right with the Lord. It is not a matter of hating anyone because of their evil ways. We should be unmoved by evil if our hearts are pure. If we are moved by evil, it is evident that there is evil in our hearts. The prince of this world comes and finds something in us where the heart is not pure. The thing that disturbs us in others reveal the fact that there is something in ourselves that relates to the ill things that we think we see in others. So often we hear human beings say, well, there is one person that I just can't stand. I get so mad when I think about that person. Did you ever feel like that about anyone? Did you ever take a good look into your own heart to find out why you felt that way about the other person? Because the point of origination, insofar as you were concerned, was in your own heart. Oh, there may have been something wrong in the other person too, probably. But again, that is his business. We cannot purify the hearts of others, but we can let our own hearts be purified. When we are willing, when we do not accept any excuses for failing to let it happen. So let us make very sure that our hearts are right. Usually the difficulty occurs with respect to those who are closest to us. That is more or less natural. We come in more immediate contact with the things that disturb in our own hearts with those who are close to us. As long as anything of that nature remains, we are not right with God. Our hearts are not pure, and consequently, 
The atmosphere which allows the development of our true character is not provided. The babe or the child or the youth, whatever point of development may be in you, will suffer. Of course, the only son, your only son, can be slain. So we see how important it is that we should let our hearts be purified. For Christmas can have no meaning to us if our hearts are not pure. No real meaning, no more meaning than it has had to human beings for a long time. The angel's song, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men, does not seem to have come any closer to fulfillment now than when it was first sung which would seem to indicate that no matter how delighted human beings have been with Christmas, it has not had any real meaning. They enjoy themselves. They have a little holiday. Some go to church, sing Christmas carols. A good time is had by all, and the world remains unchanged. The child lives one day, and perishes very shortly thereafter. All too often, it seems to be drowned in the sea of alcohol. What a travesty of Christmas. Human beings accept it as though it were natural. There are so many things human beings accept as being natural, which, if they would take a good, honest look at them, they would know are a violation of everything that is worthwhile and sacred in their experience. Oh well, we have to live in the world the way it is. How about doing something about letting the world change from the way it is to the way it ought to be? Certainly, it will never change as long as human beings are such wishy-washy creatures that they must conform with that which they know very well is wrong. Who pauses to think, really think? How many? And then there is complaint about the way the world is, all the terrible things that go on. It would be a wonderful thing if a few human beings would begin to develop backbones so that they are willing to stand for that which is right instead of going along with the devil. In our meditations, we have been privileged to share a deeper understanding of that which is right than most people. And that places upon us a greater responsibility. Let us in this Christmas season Stand for that which is right, not just in a superficial sense, not just on the basis of some self-righteous attitude, but because we let our hearts be pure, because we refuse to be controlled or influenced or dominated by any of the ill spirits which govern the lives of mankind that we might accept the government of our king and his kingdom. Then may Christmas have true meaning to us and to others. For if something has meaning to anyone, real meaning in the expression of life, it must have meaning to others. It cannot help it, for no human being lives to himself. We influence each other one way or another, in any case. Let us make sure that it is a right influence, the influence of Christmas, that the true happiness that is supposed to be experienced at Christmas time may be known and offered to the world, not only on Christmas Day, but always. Let us give glory to God in the highest, that is the first thing. Let us keep the first great commandment, 
give glory to God in the highest. And then there can be peace on earth, goodwill towards men. There is no other way. To try to get peace on earth is a most futile thing. Give glory to God in the highest, and there will be peace on earth, goodwill towards men. You do not have to struggle to build it, make it, force it to appear somehow. It will grow as naturally as the tree grows. Let us play our part in letting it be so. Our gracious Lord and Holy King, we thank Thee for the privilege of glorifying Thee on earth. For we know that the only way by which we may truly glorify Thee is to let our lives be lived in conformity with the divine design under Thy control, that all things may be caused to work together to perfection because we love and serve Thee that thy will may be done, in earth as it is in heaven, that thy kingdom may come. Father, I thank thee that it is so. When responding ones here or anywhere are willing to let it be so. In the Christ. Amen. Is your greatest desire, your primary motivation in living, to give glory to God in the highest? If it is not, then Christmas can have little meaning to you. What is the dominant motivation of your lives? What is it to give glory to God in the highest? That is the only one that can have true meaning. Wow, I hope that this Christmas season you are able to give glory to God the highest. If you are resonating with this message, then click the like button, leave a comment, share, share, share the glory of Christ being birthed through you. What exciting times we're in. I wish all of you the greatest joy of knowing the truth of the reality of love as the being you are, and knowing that in each other. May we be the humanity that we long to see, right here, right now. I wish you and all your relations a beautiful and Merry Christmas. In the name of the Christ, until the next time.